Lent. And our, our purpose for Lent is to learn from Jesus what it means to follow him. Oh, and I want to bring this up uh, before I forget it, because I think I have forgotten it until now. Uh, over on the wall is our little poster from Wednesday night, and great, great evening there at Ash Wednesday. But I've left the marker on the wall, and, and that means that, you know, those of you that want to add to your list, or those of you that weren't here, or for some reason didn't participate, the marker's always there. So if you want to wait till everybody leaves so nobody knows what you write, that's that's cool, you know, or, uh, you know, do it in some secret way, you know, backwards, or uh, if you did bubble letters, some of you would probably know who it was, so you can't do that, but uh, it's up there, all right? So uh, that kind of serves as our, you know, flag in the ground kind of thing, where, you know, you go through life sometimes, and you go, this is where I stand. So it to, to come out with, a write something down that this is what I'm going to do this Lent it is powerful, and I encourage you to feel free to do that. We begin today with a text, an event that you probably heard before. It's called the Call of the Four Fishermen. You know, uh, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And so it's Peter, Andrew, James, and John. It's from Matthew 4, 18 to 22. It says, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called to them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. The story may be uh, so familiar to us that uh, we miss kind of the, the magnitude, uh, the size of what is happening in the lives of these four men. And we think, well, isn't that nice? Jesus calls them. And I like the way he uses the words, you know, fishermen, and fishers and men. And But we we know that when leaving, when we're leaving or going away, when that happens in our lives, that it's anything but small. It's anything but routine. I mean, it's always huge. Um, I think of times when, when, when leaving happens, like, you know, some of you have done this, some of you haven't done this. You, you've got your kids and they're going to college and, and you've prepared for this. I mean, most of you guys are like, you can remember, you know, your parents boohooing in the car and make, you know, not wanting to leave the dorm room and stuff. But you got to be on the parent side of that. You know, uh, you, you've done all this. Now you get your kids to college and then you just drop them off. And, you know, it's leaving is not easy. You know, the old man crying in the car and you got something in his eye kind of thing. It's it's rough. Or uh, another instance of leaving, I think of the soldiers that are standing like in the high school gym. They're getting ready to be deployed. And, you know, the, the soldier, she said, has to say goodbye to her children. Is there anything more emotional than a soldier that's being deployed into a war zone that's saying goodbye to her children? I mean, good, saying goodbye is not easy. Or how about when your family moves? And you know it for months. But it's like, you know, it's the last week. Everybody has to do the last thing. Could you come over for one more time? We'd, we, we know you've been here your whole lives, but we'd like to have you over for dinner one more time. And all those goodbyes at school, and I know my kids went through that, all those goodbyes at school and stuff, it's very emotional. It's not easy going away. It's, it's rough stuff. And I was thinking about that, and I remembered, uh, remembered, an illustration, I think this will hit, uh, from Friends, when uh, Rachel was going away to France. <laughs> well, if I'm going to do this, I better keep going. Okay. Monica, yeah. can you come here with me okay. for a minute? Sure. Are you wearing waterproof mascara? No? No, you're so screwed. <laughs> okay. I better just say what it is I'm going to say. I better just say what it is I'm going to say. None of the 
amazing things that have happened to me in the last 10 years. What would have happened if it wasn't for you? No one has been more like a sister to me. I know what you mean. You're like a sister to me too. You're like a sister to me too. Oh, guys, we, we do it differently as men, don't we? Yeah, we, we don't do, you know, the way we leave each other is we like, hey, you still got my ball glove. You know, we do stuff like that. And then, you know, guys, we're so, you know, insecure with showing our emotions that we usually don't cry. We get mad at the guy, you know. All right, well, you just keep the ball glove then and we go away. That's what guys do. So much different. I'm glad I'm not a girl. <laughs> well, let's own this. I mean, let's be real about change and going away. Even when you know it's the right thing to do, and even when it's something that you know that has to be done, that doesn't make it fun or easy. It may be necessary, but that doesn't mean that you look forward to it. And that's because we're no different than any other object in creation. Everything that's at rest stays at rest, right, until a greater force is exerted upon it. It's If you had physics, it's Newton's first law. An object at rest stays at rest. An object in motion stays in motion with the same speed and the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Put more simply, we just sit on the couch until somebody makes us move, right? <laughs> Nobody likes to change anything. We just continue to do what we've been doing. I mean, can you own that? I can own that. You know, I'm just going to keep continue to do what I'm doing until, uh, you know, something happens. We call it everyday life. We just do the same thing. And, and that's why change is so difficult or going away is so difficult. We are objects of rest. And God is the unbalanced force. He is the, the prime mover. He is the one that pushes upon us. He acts upon our lives in ways that gets us off the couch or at least makes the couch so uncomfortable that we can't sleep on it. So this whole idea of Jesus calling us to follow him, calling us to leave our boats and our family rooms and actually go away is rather shocking if we stop and think about it. I mean, why can't I just sit here? I, I leave, you know, everybody alone. I'm just doing my own thing. Life's going okay. I'm not hurting anybody. Let me give the answer to that right now so you don't think about it any longer. You can't stay the way you are or where you are because God made us to follow him and to learn from Jesus. And that means that we have to go away. Now, consider the invitation that God gives here. In the timeline of the ministry of Jesus, this is early. Jesus uh, was baptized and the father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Then he's led by the spirit out into the wilderness where he's tempted three times by Satan over the issue is, is whether he really is the son of God. And then he leaves his hometown of Nazareth and he goes down to Capernaum. And this is on the Sea of Galilee. It's a strategic location uh, because it's a major trade route. And he would spend most of the three years of his ministry right there in Capernaum. And while he's there, he met two sets of brothers, uh, Peter and his brother Andrew and James and his brother John. They're fishermen, which, you know, made them middle class citizens. They are small businessmen. This is not a lower trade as we would think, oh, they're just fishermen, you know. We see fishermen as guys that just waste their time down at Jacobson Park. But no, this was, a, this was middle class. They were entrepreneurs. And right there by the Sea of Galilee, archaeological there's an archaeological dig there that they think pretty sure is the house of Peter. It's a pretty good-sized house. Peter's not, uh, you know, he's a man of means is the way this ends up. 
Now, Jesus, Jesus is a rabbi. Of all the titles that he's, that are used of him, rabbi, master, teacher is the prominent title. That's the way that he's seen. And in their day, Jewish rabbis would teach young men, sorry girls, young men, you know, they would teach you Torah. They would teach you law. And you would learn the, the Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament, until you're about 12 or 13 years old. Then you would go into a trade with your father. And a few of the young men, the, the best of the young men, okay, the smartest, the brightest of the young men would be asked to stay on with the rabbi and would be trained as a disciple of the rabbi. And they would literally live every day. They, they, they call it, you know, having the dust of the rabbi all over you. They would eat together. They, they would uh, study together. And they would be trained up to be rabbis themselves who would then teach other young men. And that's how the word was passed on from generation to generation. And Jesus at age 30 begins his ministry by calling 12 men from this northern region of Israel, which is really the farming area. And none of them are young. Uh, none of them are educated as far as we know. And none of them are likely disciples or good candidates to be disciples. In fact, we can say that they were very unlikely, very uneducated, untrained, undeveloped, unheard of, and generally the undisciples. They might have had t-shirts that said that. Big un on it. I don't know. No one had selected them. They weren't bright enough. They weren't at the top of the class, you see. When they were young men, no rabbi would have them, so they didn't show enough promise or skills or smarts. They were just fishermen. They were just fathers. They were just brothers. They were just sons. They were just in the same way that every other person that God calls is a just something. Later, the Apostle Paul, who was anything but a just, he was a very well-educated Pharisee, said it this way, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29. Speaking to the church at Corinth, he says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise, according to world standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. There'd be no boasting among the fishermen about, oh, we finally made the grade called by the rabbi because they were shocked. They were shocked as their families were shocked. No one in their family likely thought that they would ever be called as a disciple of anybody. But, but this is the way of God. This is the way that God does it. God calls the just. God calls those who are just salesmen and, and just teachers and just clerks and just farmers and just carpenters and just homemakers. That's who God calls. Jesus said to them, I will make you fishers of men. Had he called somebody who already thought that he was a, quote, fisher of men, he would have to unteach them before he could teach them. See, the God, the call of God for us to follow is given to us not because we have competence, because we don't have any competence in the kingdom. The call of God is not given to us because we have skills or smarts, because I don't think God is lacking skills or smarts. What do you think? No. God calls us, he invites us as just people, unqualified people, because Jesus is the teacher and we are the students. And Jesus is the master, we are the followers. And he says that we will learn from him. We had that Wednesday night in Matthew eleven twenty nine. He says that he will teach us to be disciple makers, that's fishers of men, right? And he reminds us that he has called us not we have not called ourselves. Jesus in John 15 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. You see, you didn't choose me. I chose you. The call of God comes to us from him. Now, the challenge to go with the invitation is really very radical. 
I mean, Jesus walks by two sets of brothers as they're in their boats and their nets and they're engaged in their everyday work. And he calls them to leave, to come away, to leave their families, leave their vocations, leave their plans, leave their homes, leave everything that they know as this world in order to find their new lives in the kingdom of God. And I think we have to be careful here that we don't romanticize this because we do this a lot with Scripture. You know, we hear this stuff and we, we it's just a nice little story. So, so don't romanticize this. Don't, they didn't know that they would someday be apostles. They didn't know that cathedrals would be named after them. They didn't know that children would be named after them forever and ever. A good Christian name like John, see, or Andrew. They didn't know that. The only promise that is given is that they will learn from Jesus how to disciple other people, making them fishers of men, and and there's so much left unsaid. Now, now here's just a few things that we do know. First of all, they had to leave. Life couldn't go on the way that it was. This man, Jesus, was changing lives in ways that they could not imagine. It would mean a loss of income to them. It would mean a loss of security. They had no way that they could plan for the future. It was day by day if they were following Jesus. Uh, they were putting their lives in the hands of this man, Jesus. And, and it's wild. You know, it's, it's extravagant. It's risky. It's just so God. They didn't sit down and say, well, you know, life's a little boring here. What do you guys think? Are you, are you up for an adventure? Why don't we... You know, throw in with Jesus and see what happens. Well, this is this exciting, you know? No, they had to leave who they were, who they knew, where they were, and, and what they knew about life for a future with a man that they really didn't know very well. I mean, it's, it's huge. But they had to leave. The second thing is, there could be no compromising. There could be no halfway. It's like they couldn't say, well, you know, we hear you, Jesus. I'll follow you Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I'll fish. You know, part-time work, part-time following Jesus. The Jesus has no part-time followers. That's the way we kind of think of things. If I, if I give anything to him at all, if I volunteer anything at all, well, it's more than what he was getting. So he should be happy with that. God doesn't call any part-time followers. He only calls full-time followers. Well, how can we give God half of a life? Would you, would you follow a God that says anything you can do is enough? And, you know, anything you can give me, just a little bit of your life? How can we worship a God who settles for leftovers from us? When God calls, he invites, he challenges us. There's no compromising. Third thing I think is that they were leaving behind their self-image. Uh, being a disciple of Jesus was not a prestigious thing at all. Uh, we look back on it now, we think it is less than it was not. Uh, there's constant conflict and ridicule among these disciples. They, they, they do not receive the accolades of the masses. They look on them with, <laughs> they're disciples of the Nazarene, that guy. She, twelve men he assembled. Uh, they argue with each other. They jockey for position. They were giving up their un t-shirts, okay, for a t-shirt that says, "I'm one of them." Just one of the twelve. So they become. The challenge here is enormous. They have to follow him away, away from their homes, away from their plans, away from their security, away from their reputation and their self-image. The challenge to follow Jesus away is never something that we think that we can do. As a matter of fact, if you think that God is calling you away to do something and you've got it all planned out as to how I can do this, be assured God is not in that call. God does not call us into something that we think that we can do. God invites and challenges us to follow him so that he might just pour his life in us, in the unplace, okay? Well, where's a way? Uh, let's, let's get this word from the Sea of Galilee here to Lexington. God does not call everyone to leave their families and vocations to come away with him into intense full-time service. As one that was called away, 
uh, from a hometown, called away from a vocation, let me say that it might be a whole lot easier to leave than it is to stay. When God calls you to leave your family, when God calls you to leave your vocation and your public identity, it's frightening, it's risky at the very least, but it's not more than to stay in your vocation, to stay in your family, to stay in your community and follow him right there. Well, let's not you know, say, oh, people that are missionaries or pastors, they've been called away, but I've not been called away. You see, away is leaving your self-sufficiency. Away is, is leaving this security picture that you have for the future that's based in what you can do. Away is leaving your plans, your dreams. Away is putting the call of God in your life above your call of your vocation. Away is putting the mission of Jesus before your family. Away is putting the mission of Jesus as the core of your family. Away is putting your need to be somebody important and somebody popular behind the need of Jesus Christ to use you in his kingdom. I, you know, I really think it's easier to go away to another location and go through all the tear and go through all the tears and go through all the goodbyes and all that stuff than it is to stay at home and not leave physically and follow him where you are because the away to which Jesus calls us is to be lived among people who know us so well and they can spot a phony a mile away. It takes you guys a while to spot a phony when someone new comes in, right? Some of you have heard my bowling story, but for those of you that haven't, I love to tell it, so I'll tell it again. When I was a young Christian in Illinois, I did what most people in Illinois do in the wintertime and in the Midwest, you bowl. Striking figure in a polyester shirt, I might add. <laughs> Striking figure. I was on a bowling team with four guys that I'd grown up with, went to junior high with them, had hung with them during, during high school, and we all got married. And so what do you do when you're married in Illinois to get out of the house on Wednesday night? You join a bowling team where you could roll a ball and tip some brews. Some nights there were more brews than the good rolling of the ball, but we were a pretty good bowling team, really. When I came to Christ, I stopped drinking. Not because somebody told me to, but just I just stopped drinking, uh, you know, and I kept bowling. And um, these were my friends. I didn't have a bunch of other friends and actually became a much better bowler because I could bowl for three games sober, rather than just one game sober, you know. And um, I, I actually, you know, I, I never preached to them. I didn't hand tracks out. I, I didn't like on their backswing go praise Jesus or anything like that, you know, <laughs> nothing weird. I, just, I was just Don, only now Don, you know, didn't drink. And um, one of them really had a problem with that uh, because... Uh, you know, when, when we would lose, he would say that I was the problem because I was a wet blanket on everybody. I was spoiling their party, okay, because I wasn't drinking. So one night I showed up on Wednesday night in my little, you know, polyester shirt and my bowling ball, and um, they had replaced me on the team. Somebody else was bowling instead of me. And my old buddies didn't even have enough guts to call me up and say, uh, Van Zant, you're off the team. They just had the guy showed up and everybody just kind of sat there and looked at their shoes, you know, kind of awkward moment to say the least. But after a few weeks, I realized that I was no longer busy on Wednesday nights and now I could go to the pastor's Bible study. So I got nothing else to do, you know. Beats changing diapers, right? Might as well go to the pastor's Bible study, yeah. And so I started going to the pastor's Bible study. And like I, yeah, they're laughing like I ever changed a diaper, you know. <laughs> so started going for five years. I sat under this man's teaching and I learned so much in those five years. But I know what it is to stay where you are and be called away in your heart and yet physically have to stay where you are. It's not easy. It's, it's a rough path. 
Our way means finding time to read God's word while I'm a mother, while I'm a father, while I'm an employee, a neighbor, a friend. And all those other life demands of vocation and friends and all those different hats that we wear, all those different people that we become based on who we're around, oh, they push really hard against this away call on our life. We're called to live for him among those who do not live for him. Uh, We're called to live to learn how to live, how to, excuse me, how to love the unlovely, not just on Sundays, but every day, because all the unlovelies, they seem to show up at work and in the family and in different places next door. We go away, we never leave. We accept the yoke of Jesus, and and we never call the moving truck. We, we leave our nets and our fathers, and we learn from him as he teaches us what it means to pursue God and to obey God and to imitate the life of Jesus. And I admit that this call to stay and be away doesn't get the attention that the other gets. I mean, somebody leaves and they go, oh, she's going into the mission field. I admire her so much. Or he's being ordained. Uh, How inspirational, you know. That gets all the attention. Uh, The away is seen by all, and it's quick and it's identifiable. But to stay home and be away, to follow Christ where we are, changing slowly, daily, forgiving those who've harmed us a hundred times over because they keep harming us, Uh, speaking for Jesus, representing him in the circles in which we have always lived. That's really following Jesus. That's really following him out of the boats and going away. You know, I think it's time to move on Um, God calls you from everything that interferes with you pursuing, with you obeying, with you imitating Jesus Christ. Everything, not just the things you think you can handle, everything. Jesus, again, is this unbalanced force that pushes against us in our place of rest, where we have come to rest in our lives. And this Lent, God is calling us out of our boats. He's calling us away from those places of false security that we have accepted And he's calling us to follow him. Is he calling you today? Jesus said, um, no one comes to me unless the Father calls. So today, is he calling you? I ask that question of you. I want you to take this home with you. Uh, The last statement, we can say that I will not follow, but we can't say that I cannot follow because... The actual following is uh, a matter of me giving my will over to God and saying, yes, I'll get out of the boat, and God is the one that leads. Let's sit with that just for a few minutes in prayer. As deep cries out